At six, the Conservative MP Sir David Amos has been stabbed to death in Essex. The 69-year-old was attacked with a knife multiple times as he met his constituents at a local church in Leon C. He died at the scene. A 25-year-old man is being held on suspicion of murder. The Prime Minister has described Sir David as one of the kindest people in politics. Well, I think all our hearts are full of shock and sadness today uh, to the loss of Sir David Amos MP, who was killed in his constituency surgery uh, in a church after almost 40 years of continuous service to the people of Essex and the whole of the United Kingdom. One local councillor who was at the scene expressed the shock felt in the community. We've lost a very good, hard-working constituency MP who worked for everyone. Didn't matter who you were, didn't matter about your religion or your culture, if you had a problem, he would work for you. The police are due to make a statement shortly. We will bring you the latest, also tonight. PCR tests are suspended at a laboratory in Wolverhampton amid concerns that more than 40,000 people were told they didn't have COVID when they did. Overheard at the Welsh Parliament, the Queen appears to express irritation at world leaders' inaction on climate change. And free to fly in again, the United States is opening up its borders to fully vaccinated travellers from the 8th of November. And coming up on the News Channel, we'll have more reaction to the death of David Amos and tributes to the Conservative MP from across the country. Good evening and welcome to the BBC News at six. The Conservative MP Sir David Amos has been stabbed to death during a constituency meeting at a church in Essex. The 69-year-old was attacked as he met with constituents in Leon C just before midday. Police arrived at the Belfair's Methodist Church within minutes, but Sir David died at the scene despite the efforts of paramedics. A 25-year-old man was arrested at the church and is being held on suspicion of murder. Sir David Amos had been an MP in Essex for almost 40 years. He is the second serving MP to be killed while attending a constituency surgery in five years following the death of the Labour MP, Joe Cox. Tonight, the Prime Minister has described Sir David as a fine public servant, one of the kindest, nicest, most gentle people in politics. Our Home Affairs correspondent, Daniel Sanford, is at the scene. Daniel. Yes, Sophie, there's a feeling of bewilderment here in Leon C, almost a sense of disbelief. I saw people bursting into tears as news came through that Sir David had died of his injuries. He was known as an MP with very strong views, but also known as a man who stood up for those he represented. And now he's gone. Forensics teams and firearms officers at the Methodist Church where the local MP had been holding his fortnightly surgery. Sir David Amos's meeting with constituents had been from 10 until 1, but just after midday, he was stabbed multiple times. He was treated at the scene by police and ambulance staff, but died before they could get him to hospital. Sir David Amos was the MP for South End West and well respected locally. He'd represented the seat for the Conservative Party since 1997 and was a high profile Brexit supporter and a member of the European Research Group. I think all our hearts are full of shock and sadness today uh, to the loss of Sir David Amos MP who was killed in his constituency surgery uh, in a church after almost 40 years of continuous service to the people of Essex and the whole of the United Kingdom and the reason I think people are so shocked and saddened is above all he was one of the kindest nicest most gentle people in Politics. The police investigation is still in its early stages, but a 25-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of murder. Detectives say the man was detained shortly after officers arrived and a knife was recovered at the scene. One witness who was opposite the church when it happened told me he saw a woman coming out and calling an ambulance and then after armed police arrived, he saw a man of African appearance being led away. 
As constituents gathered near the church, there was a sense of acute shock and all were keen to pay tribute, regardless of which party they'd voted for. And it's so tragic. This is such a nice area. And for this to happen is... What can I say? Yeah, he was so nice people, person, loved everybody. And he was doing so brilliant job for all the local residents and everyone. You know. At 69 years old, Sir David was a veteran politician who'd first been elected to Parliament in 1983. He's now become the second MP to be killed at a constituency surgery in just over five years. Joe Cox was murdered in Bristol in June 2016. Today is a dark and a, and a shocking day, the more so because, heartbreakingly, we've been here before. Informed by his faith, Sir David had a profound sense of public duty, and he was highly respected and much liked across the Houses of Parliament on all sides. The murder of another MP at a meeting with constituents has again sent shockwaves through the world of politics. How can politicians do their best for those they represent if public surgeries are seen as too dangerous? Detectives are now trying to work out what the motivation behind the murder may have been. If there's a sense that there was an extremist ideology involved, then counter-terrorism detectives will take over the case. Sophie. Daniel Sanford with the latest there. Thank you. Well, Sir David Amos had been an MP in Essex since 1983. He was married with five children. The backbench MP was a well-known figure in his local community and tributes to him have poured in from all sides of the political spectrum, as our political correspondent Damien Grammaticus reports. Sir David Amos, described today as a man who devoted his life to his constituents. An MP for almost 40 years, this was general election night in 1992. His victory signalled the surprise win for John Major's Conservatives. Andrew Amos has been duly elected to serve as member for the second constituency. He was known as highly accessible to constituents in Southend, an energetic advocate for the area. Will my right honourable friend tell one of his ministers to organise a city status competition so at long last Southend on Sea can become a city? The Prime Minister! Those who knew him best have been left shocked. He was devoted to that constituency, uh, and he was always full of enthusiasm uh, for things that were going on in South End, full of enthusiasm for Parliament, full of life. It's, it's, it's just a horrible shock. His senseless killing follows a series of attacks on MPs, all in their constituencies. In 2000, Nigel Jones, a Liberal Democrat, attacked with a sword. His aide, Andrew Pennington, died. In 2010, the Labour MP Stephen Timms suffered life-threatening injuries. Stabbed in the stomach, he survived. And in 2016, Labour's Joe Cox murdered, shot and stabbed while out during the referendum campaign. Her killing happened as the nation argued over Brexit. Many worry that political debates are becoming increasingly polarised and social media has fuelled the trend. Among them, Joe Cox's sister, now an MP herself. It's really important that we get good people in public life. But this is the risk that we're all taking. You know, and, and so many MPs today will be scared by this. And my partner came home and said, I don't want you to do it anymore. In recent years, security around Parliament has become intense. Here, MPs are tightly protected. But outside, in their local areas, they're vulnerable. Sir David Amos himself wrote after the attack on Nigel Jones, we all make ourselves readily available to our constituents. It could happen to any of us. I think more should have been learned from previous attacks. And I suspect that the House authorities will now do a complete review of security for MPs and peers and their staff. But we need to do it for everybody who comes face to face with the general public. Sir David leaves behind his wife and five children and urgent questions. Why are they now bereaved? Why has more not been done to protect MPs? Sir David Amos, who has died today at the age of 69. 
Well, the Home Secretary, Priti Patel, has tonight said questions are rightly being asked about the safety of MPs and she would provide updates in due course. Well, let's go to Westminster and our political editor, Laura Koonsberg. And Laura, deep shock tonight and, of course, a lot of questions. There certainly are, Sophie. Of course, there's a basic question of exactly what happened with this terrible crime. There's a harder question about how MPs' security could be improved when they are out and about. You know, Parliament these days has got pretty tight security, the big gates, the panelled walls where MPs come to serve. But part of the deal in this country, in that unwritten contract between us, the public, and the politicians who serve us, is that we expect to see them face to face. We expect to see them out and about in their constituency. And most MPs meet that expectation only too gladly. But it is a sad fact that in recent years, when political debate has been very toxic at times, that for many MPs, they have felt that the job has come with some intimidation. It has come with abuse, whether online or in real life. It has come with sometimes harassment, not just of them, but also of their staff. And there's a difficult question to solve here that agonizingly was asked very profoundly after the death of Joe Cox five years ago. To what extent has the way that we all talk to each other, the way that politicians debate, the way that people who are interested in politics have conversations online too, to what extent has that made the job of serving the public one that can be dangerous? And that is a question that Westminster again so sadly will be asking tonight in the days to come. Our political editor, Laura Koonsberg in Westminster, thank you. And we will have more on Sir David Amos later in the programme. And we're expecting an update from Essex Police. We will bring you the details as we get them. But the time is just after 10 past six. And our main story, of course, this evening is the Conservative MP, Sir David Amos, who has been stabbed to death in Essex. He was attacked at a church in Leon C during a meeting with constituents, a 25-year-old man has been arrested. And coming up on the News Channel, we'll have more reaction to the death of David Amos and tributes to the Conservative MP from across the country. It's emerged that tens of thousands of people who had a PCR test were told they didn't have coronavirus when, in fact, they probably did. Operations have been suspended at a private laboratory in Wolverhampton after more than 40,000 people who'd had positive lateral flow tests in September and October were then given negative PCR tests. Most of the affected cases are in the southwest of England, with some in the southeast and Wales. Our health editor, Hugh Pym, reports. These are the lateral flow tests that we took. Graham has the lateral flow test results, which suggested there was COVID in his household, except that the PCR tests, which they then had done, told a different story, negative. Friends had similar experiences. Now he realises he probably did have the virus. I coached football, I carried on with that, um, and went about everything as I normally would, um, because I was convinced I just had a cold. I feel terrible. Um, my wife took extra precautions as a teacher, but I know she's upset that she may have taken the virus into school. The problems have been traced to a private laboratory on a science park in Wolverhampton. Around 43,000 PCR tests processed there from September the 8th are thought to have given false negative results. Work at the lab has been suspended. Suspicions had been raised in recent weeks, including tweets by this academic. He says the consequences are potentially serious. Tens of thousands of people have been given false negative results, thinking they maybe don't have COVID, even though they've had symptoms and a positive lateral flow device. They've been going to school, they've been going to work and potentially infecting other people. Public health leaders say after they were alerted, they needed time to work out which lab might be at fault. Why could you have not intervened sooner? We have been looking over that time period and we do listen and in fact we welcome feedback. I want to make sure that if there are any further problems with other laboratories we can absolutely spot them as quickly as possible so I'll be conducting um, a serious incident investigation within the Health Security Agency. The latest revelations come at a time of rising Covid cases highlighted by the latest Office for National Statistics release on community infections. The ONS survey suggests that last week just over one million people in the UK had the virus, the highest since January. 
and that was largely driven by infections amongst children. But whereas case rates went up in England and Wales, they fell back in Scotland and were little changed in Northern Ireland. The vaccine means that although we have the same number of cases of January, we're not going to see anywhere near the same number of deaths or the same number of admissions. That said, we're still seeing a significant number of admissions, over 700 a day. We're still seeing over 100 deaths a day. More cases means more work for the test and trace system. In the wake of news about faulty results, officials argue it was an isolated problem and the public should have faith in the testing and lab network. Hugh Pym, BBC News. Well, the latest official coronavirus figures show there were 43,489 new infections recorded in the latest 24-hour period. The average number of cases per day in the past week now stands at 40,149. 7,086 people were in hospital with COVID yesterday. Another 145 deaths have been recorded. That's of people who died within 28 days of a positive test, which means, on average, there were 117 deaths per day in the past week. On vaccinations, 85.8% of the population aged 12 and over have had their first dose of a vaccine, and 78.8% have been double jabbed. Well, the United States is opening its borders again to fully vaccinated travellers. From the 8th of November, anyone who is vaccinated and has had a negative test before travelling will be allowed to enter the country again. There's also good news for travellers returning to England. From the 24th of October, anyone who's fully vaccinated will be able to use private lateral flow tests rather than more expensive PCR tests to prove their COVID status. Here's our transport correspondent, Caroline Davis. Packaged up for jetting off. From the 24th of October, if you're double jabbed and coming from a non-red list country, you'll just need one of these, a cheaper lateral flow test, rather than a PCR. Testing companies are making the switch. Um, it you know, took some time to plan and prepare, and of course um, we're ready, but others might not be. It will make a big difference to the cost of travelling. PCR tests can cost around £100. Natural flow tests are closer to 20 uh, We calculated that it was going to be about £150 to £160. Lauren is travelling to see her family in Malta in November. They've not yet met her 16-month-old daughter. She feels more confident to travel and the reduced cost is a bonus. But yeah, Maltese food and my mum, that's all that I want right now. <laughs> With much of the rest of the economy moving again, international travel companies have felt that they are on a different timeline. However, with changes to the traffic light system, a reduction in the number of countries on the red list, and now this, the hope is that they might be able to start catching up. Bookings for holidays have gone up beyond just half term. We're seeing very strong demand going into Christmas and into next summer as well. So that pent up demand we're seeing is starting to, to book further out now. So people are starting to really have confidence that the travel plans they're going to make are actually going to happen. And earlier today, there was more good news for those hoping to travel to the US. Fully vaccinated UK travellers can visit from the 8th of November for the first time in nearly 20 months. PCR tests can be used to identify variants of concern. Lateral flow tests can't. The government have argued that the level of vaccination has changed the calculation when it comes to the type of test needed. But some in the scientific community disagree on the timing of this change. We're worried about the winter, we're worried about variants. Let's keep in mind, despite fantastic vaccine uptake, we do have groups in the population not yet covered, particularly young people. And so I think most of us in the public health community would prefer this to happen later, not immediately. The date and policy are currently only confirmed in England. The other nations are still in discussions about it. But despite some uncertainties, travel for many into the country is about to get easier. Caroline Davis, BBC News. In Afghanistan, at least 37 people have been killed and more than 70 others injured after three explosions destroyed a mosque in the southern city of Kandahar. The building was being used for Friday prayers by the minority Shia Muslim community. It's being reported that the blasts were caused by suicide bombers. One attacker detonated the device at the door of the mosque. Two more were set off inside. A leading huntsman has been found guilty of offering members of the hunting community advice on how to hold illegal fox hunts. 
Mark Hankinson, a director of the Masters of Foxhounds Association, took part in online seminars on how legal trail hunting, which involves riders and hounds following a preset route, could be used as a smokescreen for illegal fox hunts. The seminars were given to the police by hunt saboteurs. Hankinson was fined £3,500, including damages and costs. The Queen has been overheard expressing frustration at world leaders in action on climate change, saying she is irritated by people who talk but don't do. Her remarks were picked up on a microphone during conversations at yesterday's opening of the Welsh Parliament, the Senate, in Cardiff. The Queen, who is due to attend the COP26 climate summit in Glasgow in November, was heard saying she did not know who was actually attending. Our Royal Correspondent Nicholas Witchell reports. She'd been in Cardiff for the opening of the Welsh Parliament. Afterwards, she chatted to officials and the conversation turned to COP26, the conference on global warming in Glasgow, to which all the main world leaders have been invited. The exchanges are difficult to hear, hence the subtitles. They talk, but they don't do. That from the Queen is a revealing insight into how she regards some politicians. It's particularly striking after very similar comments this week from other members of the royal family. Here was Prince Charles in a BBC interview on Monday. It's taken far too long. World leaders are gathering in Glasgow to talk about the kind of issues that you were... Yeah, but they just talk. And the problem is to get action on the ground, which is what I've been trying to do for the last 40 years. And this was Prince William in another BBC interview yesterday. We can't have more um, clever speak and clever words, but not enough action. So the three most senior members of the British royal family are all essentially saying or thinking the same thing. But which leaders might the Queen have had in mind? The Australian Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, has finally confirmed that he will attend COP26. Uh, I confirmed my attendance at the Glasgow summit. The big question is whether China's President Xi will attend. He last visited Britain for a state visit in 2015. Will he be in Glasgow for COP26? It's far from certain. But it can be assumed that the Queen is hoping that he and other leaders who are still hesitating will be there to talk and to do. Nicholas Witchell, BBC News. The government is planning to temporarily relax the rules around the number of deliveries foreign lorry drivers can make. Ministers say the measures will ease pressure on supply chains, particularly in the run-up to Christmas. But there's been some criticism from hauliers who have warned that the move will undercut British operators. Here's our business editor, Simon Jack. Through Dover alone, nearly 3,000 lorries arrive from the EU every day. Before Brexit, EU drivers were free to pick up work while here in the UK. That changed in January. Facing supply chain problems, the government offered three-month visas for 5,000 drivers. Only 20 applied. So now the government plans to let foreign drivers do more deliveries while they're on UK soil. Since Brexit, EU drivers arriving here in the UK are allowed to do two domestic UK delivery jobs in the one week they're allowed to stay. Under this proposal, they could do an unlimited number of jobs in an extended two-week period in a scheme that would last for six months. And the industry estimates that means tens of thousands of UK delivery jobs would be done by lower paid and therefore lower priced EU hauliers. UK firms say that will undercut companies here who have had to offer UK drivers wage hikes of 20% plus to attract and retain staff. Fuel duty is a lot lower in EU countries to what it is in the UK. The driver in the seat in their country will be cheaper. Foreign hauliers coming into this country to do our work will most definitely cut our rates. What then happens is, is big companies then decide that that is the going rate and they give you a choice as a business. You either do it for that or you don't do it at all. Resorting to using foreign labour seems to many in the industry at odds with what the Prime Minister said last week. The answer to the present stresses and strains, which are mainly a function of growth and economic revival, is not to reach for that same old lever of uncontrolled immigration. This morning, the Transport Secretary argued it was not uncontrolled and made pragmatic sense. Having some additional capacity right now, I think everybody agrees, is a, is a good idea. This is a quick way of doing it. It doesn't require visas um, to do. People are already here. 
Um, so it's just a common sense measure uh, at these times. As I say, it's, it's one of very many things. Many things that include 800 short-term visas for butchers where the exit of EU workers has led to labour shortages in the pork industry, a move welcomed by a sector that has already seen thousands of pigs destroyed and incinerated. It's a welcome uh, piece of news, isn't it? It is going to be a bit hand-to-mouth over the next few months for everybody. And, uh, and some people have, have reached that critical point already. Um, we are going to just hopefully hang on. Supply chains are stressed around the world. Reaching for EU labour was not part of the post-Brexit script, but the government also knows a supply chain that can't deliver would be a very unattractive political Christmas present. Simon Jack, BBC News. Now it's her first new album for six years. Adele, one of the biggest selling singers of the 21st century, has burst back onto the scene today with a much anticipated comeback. The star said the new music is her attempt at explaining her divorce to her son. Our music correspondent Mark Savage reports. There ain't no gold in this ring. Yeah, and when I was singing it, you know, for the recording and stuff like that, but there's just there's an element of hope in it, which in turn gave me hope. You know, because I was at my wit's ends, you know, in the beginning of 2019. We heard that she'd broken up. You think, oh, there are going to be, inevitably, as sad as it is, for everybody concerned, there are going to be some really good songs um, coming out of the pain that she's been through. And, you know, I really admire the honesty um, for her to talk about so openly what has happened and all the feelings that she's had. Adele's new record comes with big expectations. She already has 15 Grammys, one Oscar, and nine Brit Awards. And she's inspired a new generation of artists, including fellow Brit nominee Joy Crooks. I think the thing that Adele made me feel okay with is that I'm not afraid of ballads. I know that in my past, I've had friends when I was younger be like, why are you writing these kinds of songs? And I remember feeling a bit ashamed of my writing. And then the second thing is, amidst all her success, all of the things that could have changed her accolades, everything, she's just so real. Yeah, maybe, keep trying though. You know, the other one was like, I'm busy working. So that was the perfect um, response for me. <laughs> Mark Savage, BBC News. Let's have a look at the weather now with Chris Fawkes. Hi right, Sophie, and the weather brightened up quite nicely today for most parts of the country. We saw some long spells of sunshine, but it did feel a little bit cooler and fresher. However, that cool down is a brief one because as we go through this weekend, milder air is going to be pushing back across our shores from the Atlantic, so we will see those temperatures rising. Now, this afternoon we had temperatures of around about 14 degrees Celsius in London. Through the weekend, those temperatures will climb to about 17 Celsius. Glasgow goes from about 11 to 15 degrees, but the milder weather will be affecting all parts of us. Now, overnight tonight, we are going to see that milder weather start to arrive from the southwest. With that comes a lot of cloud, could be an odd patch of mist and fog, an odd spot of rain as well. We'll keep the clear skies, though, for most of the night across northeast England into parts of southern Scotland. And it's here where we'll see some of the lowest temperatures, cold enough for a nip of frost, actually, in the countryside. So for some, a chilly start to the day on Saturday. But remember that milder air already with us in the southwest. Now, for many on Saturday morning, quite a cloudy start to the day. There could be an odd spit of rain falling from the cloud, particularly across parts of northern England, southern Scotland. Northern Scotland stays bright with some sunshine, and we'll see some sunnier skies working in across southern England, Wales and the Midlands as we go through the afternoon. Temperatures higher than they were today, 15 to 16 degrees Celsius pretty widely, but Scotland, that milder air is yet to arrive. However, it will do. We'll see some rain Saturday night affecting many areas of the UK, heaviest across the north, but that rain will become lighter and patchier through Sunday morning. In the afternoon, there'll be a few cloud breaks every now and then, a few bright or sunny spells coming through. Those temperatures on the mild side for the time of year, we're looking at highs of 17 degrees in London, 14 is average for this stage of October. You can see those temperatures rising in Scotland as well, 14 in Glasgow and a 13 in Aberdeen. That's your latest weather, Sophie. Chris, thank you. Well, before we go, let's return to our main story this evening, the death of the Conservative MP Sir David Amos, who was repeatedly stabbed at his constituency surgery in Essex at midday today. Daniel Sanford is in Lee on Sea with the update on the police investigation. Daniel. 
Yes, Sophie, the Chief Constable of Essex Police is uh, speaking uh, just now as we're on air and he has uh, confirmed that Sir David Amos uh, suffered multiple injuries. He described it as a difficult incident, said that the emergency services had battled to try to save Sir David but had been unsuccessful and perhaps uh, most importantly, uh, in terms of the development of this story, he said that this investigation is now going to be uh, led by specialist counter-terrorism officers. He said that it will be for the investigators to decide whether this is a terrorism incident, but from now on, the investigation will be led by specialist counter-terrorism officers. Daniel Sanford with the latest there from Essex. Thank you. And that is all from us. There's, of course, continuing coverage on the BBC News Channel right now. But now on BBC One, we join the BBC's news teams where you are. Goodbye.